Hi, I'm Courtney Morrison, and you're listening to Engagement Drivers, presented by Everyone Social. Each week, we'll share actionable tips, strategies, and success stories that you and your teams can use to steer your brand, social, and employee engagement in the right direction. On today's episode, I'm lucky to be talking with Marissa King, who is a professor of organizational behavior at the Yale School of Management and the author of Social Chemistry, a book that really changed the way that I think about networking and the impact networks have on pretty much everything in our lives. Marissa, thanks so much for having this discussion with me. It's a pleasure to talk with you, Courtney. In your book, Social Chemistry, you share so many great examples of people that have different network styles. How do you define those three network types and what are some of the benefits of each of them? What we know from decades of research is is most people's networks can be characterized according to one of three types. And while oftentimes when we think about the benefits of networks, and we know that networks have many benefits, as you mentioned, right, your likelihood of getting a job, your pay, your promotion, how happy you are in life, or even how long you're likely to live, are all determined by the type of network you have. And so while oftentimes many people focus on network size, it's really understanding which of these three types that's critical and figuring out what you are. So we can think about our three different network types. And our, your network is really just simply the traces of interaction that you have on a day-to-day basis, whether it's bumping into someone at the coffee shop or your more enduring relationships with friends and family. And because we're all essentially making trade-offs between how we invest our time and where we, where we actually spend our time, most of us can be thought of as one of three types, which I refer to as brokers, expansionists, or conveners. So we can start with thinking about brokers as one type. Brokers networks are really characterized by the fact that they span different social circles. So a broker may have spent a lot of time working in an engineering department. They may speak frequently with people in marketing and also like to play bridge on the weekends. And because those three groups don't normally talk together, by speaking to three different social circles, brokers are really well positioned to be innovative to recombine ideas and be creative since we know that innovation and creativity comes through recombination. So to figure out whether or not you're a broker, you could start by asking yourself if um, you had a birthday party or a barbecue with the people who were invited there all know one another outside of you at the outset, or would you have to figure out like, how am I going to bring these different people together who don't normally know one another, perhaps exclude one of those groups and get together with them at a separate time? If that sounds familiar to you, you're likely a broker. Brokers also are um, defined by an interesting personality characteristic, which is known as high self-monitoring, which is really just how chameleon-like you are. Um, So you can figure out whether or not you have this tendency by asking yourself, are you good at making impromptu speeches on things you know nothing about? If you are, um, you're likely have this chameleon-like property that makes you a really effective broker. When I was reading about brokers, I definitely related to a lot of what you put out there. And then when I took the assessment, I was not very surprised to find that I, I definitely have broker tendencies and just I've always enjoyed like learning from different people and and being sort of able to to bridge those and kind of connect people and ideas that are different. Um, so it was really interesting to see how that you know has impacted the way that my career has changed and and things like that that I hadn't really thought about before. Yeah, I, and I love that how you describe it. I mean, thinking about it with this position of curiosity or just being able to connect new ideas. And that really is the hallmark of being an effective broker. Um, I'm also a broker, um, which was just, which I still find surprising to some degree. Um, although I've been trying to be a convener for a long time, and we can talk about those in a minute. Um, and the benefit, right, is this innovation and creativity. There's also strong benefits um, associated with work-life balance. But the drawback is because of this chameleon-like nature, um, that brokers can often also be greeted with suspicious. And people um, oftentimes are like, oh, are you one of us? Or are you not one of us? We know that they're really at risk for character assassination, but um, the way to overcome this, we know from research by I.M. Kleinbaum, is actually to broker with empathy. So um, you can maximize many of those benefits that you pointed out, Courtney, but also overcome some of the drawbacks by doing 
bringing people together, but being engaging in perspective taking and really trying to do it with empathy. Empathy is really like the word of the past year and the way that we've been able to deal with things. So that's that's really hopeful. Um, can you share more about um, the conveners that you were mentioning? Sure. So the conveners networks are really characterized by a dense web of interaction. So if you ask yourself, do your friends all know with one another? If they do, you're likely a convener. Conveners all also invest a lot in maintaining their existing relationships. So we're all essentially making a trade-off between are we meeting new people or investing and strengthening our existing relationships. And conveners really focus on developing and strengthening relationships with a core group of people. That dense web of interaction in which everyone knows one another allows conveners to have the property of there's a lot of trust in their network. There's a lot of reciprocity. And they also that gives them a lot of reputational benefits. But we also know that the greatest mental health benefits come from a convening like network. Very interesting. And so then the third type is the are the expansionists. Can you can you go a little bit more into into how they differ? Sure. So expansionists are oftentimes what we think of as quintessential networkers. So if conveners are really focusing on maintaining and developing a really strong set of relationships with a smaller group of people. Expansionist network is really large, and that's what its hallmark is. So while most of us know around 650 people on average, expansionists know orders of magnitude more. So you, to figure out whether or not you're an expansionist, you can ask yourself how many people you know named Emily and how many people you know named Alan. And when I say know them, uh, have you seen them in the past two to three years or could you reach out to them because you have their contact info without having to Google them or um, reach out to someone else? So if you know two Emilys and two Allens or Adams, um, if you know two people with each of those names, then you're likely an expansionist. So that puts your network well over a thousand people. It's a benefit of these large networks is you have a lot of influence. You have the ability to change minds. It gives you a lot of visibility. But the downside to this extraordinarily large network, somewhat surprisingly, is that actually expansionists tend to be more lonely uh, because they know a lot of people, the depth of those relationships um, is much weaker. And so as a result, they're really at a risk for um, increased risk of loneliness. We had a lot of questions here about, you know, how can I better engage my network and, and grow it? Do you have any advice from research and examples that you've seen, you know, tips for people that are looking to engage their networks better? It's a hard really of engaging with one's network is thinking about how, what is the fundamental principle by how networks work? And what we know is that the most core principle for understanding how networks function is the principle of reciprocity. So the idea, if we think about investing in a network, what you want to think about is what you can give. And oftentimes people are actually reluctant to engage with our network because it feels like, oh, this is very too strategic. It's too self-centered. But we know um, by flipping that and thinking about what can you give, that it can help overcome some of those mental obstacles. But it also is really at the core for effective engagement that you really need to invest in your network. And oftentimes people are like, oh my goodness, like, well, what do I possibly have to give? Right? And there's so many things that we all have to give, particularly in this moment. So thinking about even simply reaching out and saying like, hey, I thought of you, or how are you checking in on someone? How are you doing in this moment? I'm mean, just letting people feel that they are being heard and seen and understood. And it's in many ways a big, a huge gift, uh, particularly in this moment. Marissa, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I loved your book and find your research so interesting and helpful. For anyone listening that wants to learn more about social chemistry and assessing your network type, I'll put a link in the show notes to both Marissa's book and also where you can take a quiz and find out. So be sure to check that out. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with more engagement insights. Want to know how Everyone's Social can provide you with the tools needed to keep everyone at your company connected, informed, creating, and sharing? Visit everyonesocial.com to learn more.